Robertson White and Max Mediation Group and the University of Florida Levin College of Law's uh, continuing webinar series. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're proud to have the uh, uh, sponsorship and help of uh, the University of Florida Levin College of Law Institute for Dispute Resolution. Uh, my name is Richard Lord. I'm one of uh, our mediators here with Upchurch, Watson White and Max. Uh, and today we're going to be presenting the mediation option in international commercial arbitration. Uh, we're very pleased. Uh, to have uh, on the webinar today um, one of my colleagues, Ricardo Cata, and we also have um, with us uh, Ed Mullins. And I'm going to uh, introduce them, and then we're going to talk uh, a lot of substance today. Um, but uh, I wanted to uh, just let you all know a few things about uh, our guest today. Uh, Ed Mullins, he's a founding shareholder of the Asiraga Davis Mullins and Grossman firm. Uh, he has an extensive uh, litigation and arbitration and appellate uh, practice, uh, including international commercial litigation and uh, arbitration. Uh, he brings to his practice a broad experience as a commercial litigator, having handled uh, many disputes, including contract, business tort, media, uh, intellectual property, and class action disputes. Uh, very importantly, he is a former chair of the Florida Bar International Law Section and has held various leadership positions with the American Bar Association. Uh, he, he's the former chair of the Appellate Court Rules Committee of the Florida Bar and uh, has been recognized many times uh, uh, for his skill and experience, uh, including um, being in the top Miami 100 super lawyers for 2013 and 14, uh, most effective lawyer by the Daily Business Review, a finalist uh, in both appellate and public interest uh, in 12 and 13, uh, and best lawyers in the America, commercial litigation and international arbitration categories uh, from 2008 to 14, and uh, was the 2014 Lawyer of the Year for International Commercial Arbitration. Uh, my colleague Ricardo Cata, uh, is one of our mediators here, his mediation practice uh, focuses on product uh, liability, uh, both consumer, industrial, and uh, pharmaceutical. Uh, professional liability, premises liability, and cross-border and commercial disputes before joining us. Uh, Ricardo practiced law in South Florida for 38 years, uh, during the last 25 with the national law firm of Wilson Elzer in their Miami office, uh, ultimately becoming their regional managing partner in 2007. Uh, Ricardo's law practice focused mainly in representing national and international clients in the areas of product liability hotel and resort liability and commercial contractual disputes uh, with clients from the U.S., Mexico, uh, Central America, the Caribbean, and South America. In addition to his Florida bar admission, he's also admitted to all three federal districts in Florida uh, and to the District of Puerto Rico. Uh, he's bilingual in Spanish and English. I know we have some questions uh, about that that some people have submitted. Uh, and he's able to mediate uh, both uh, in English and Spanish. He's a member of the American Bar Association's ADR section, as well as the international law section of the Florida Bar and uh, the Miami International Arbitration Society. So those are just brief excerpts of their uh, very lengthy uh, uh, biographies. Uh, they're both very well qualified to be speaking on the topics that we are asking them to speak on today. And uh, again, we want to welcome all of you now. We have. Uh, uh, larger number of folks who've actually joined us, and I'll just share that we do have, no, unfortunately, no way to hear from you uh, during the uh, webinar actually audibly or live, but you can use the chat feature that you will find in your webinar uh, menu or toolbar that you may see to the right of your screen. Use that red or orange arrow that you see to minimize it, but if you have a question for us, um, go ahead and submit it via the chat function. Uh, we uh, do thank you all. We did get a number of questions in advance, and a lot of the questions that were asked um, uh, we think are answered in the presentation that you'll uh, uh, hear and see today. Um, if by chance we don't get it answered, uh, uh, you know, we will uh, ask you to email us uh, any questions after the webinar, and like we said during the webinar, feel free to send us questions using the chat function um, in the lower right corner of the uh, GoToMeeting toolbar. On the very final slide at the very end, uh, we're going to be giving the CLE information um, and the Florida Bar course number for that credit. Uh, and before we jump in, I do want to also add, um, Ed, I understand you'll be uh, the moderator for a, a panel that Ricardo will be on at the ILAT conference on February 27th uh, down in Miami at the Conrad. That is correct. 
That's great. We're, we're, we're glad to have you here today and appreciate um, the opportunity for uh, Ricardo to join you there. Uh, we have a number of assumptions that are going to form the basis of our presentation today. I'm going to talk about those very briefly. Um, and as uh, we move through the presentation, just understand that we are making several assumptions um, that kind of drive uh, our observations. Uh, first, you know, we know that companies are open to an alternative to arbitration. Arbitration uh, has been around quite a while. Its popularity has waxed and waned in different quarters. But we know that um, there is, and we believe that there is, and thus it's one of our assumptions, that uh, companies are open to an alternative to arbitration. Uh, another assumption that we're making is that mediating a case can be, as we all know, uh, theoretically and most of the time practically and in reality quicker and less expensive um, than, than other routes. Uh, there's also an assumption based on the recognized increasing complexity uh, and related exposures and costs that drive up the overall arbitration costs. In addition, um, we uh, are making the assumption that having the right people uh, working within a proper process can be something that uh, litigants, disputants, and counsel can uh, explore together and ultimately agree to. Uh, another assumption is that there, needs, there is an education or learning curve and that there is a need for uh, sometimes lawyers in jurisdictions that may be less familiar with mediation, um, less familiar with the interplay between uh, mediation and arbitra arbitration, uh, you know, that there's an education that can be conducted that you all as litigators can help with uh, and that your mediators who you select um, uh, you can, can help with. Uh, you know, mediation is not as ingrained in a lot of places uh, that you might find yourself, um, you know, uh, dealing with. And we do think that that is an important aspect. Education, you're getting educated today and you will have a continuing role in the education of your adversary and co-counsel um, and, and clients as well. Um, we also are, are making this assumption that mediating earlier uh, or it's certainly not, uh, you know, too late in the arbitration process has advantages because of, you know, arbitration being a, a very end-loaded process. And uh, we do think using it at the right time, it's like what is the tool and when do you use it, you know, using mediation at the right time in the arbitration process will add value to your clients and it's the right thing to do uh, for many clients and many disputes and you have to kind of think proactively about, you know, which cases, when, and how you get there. And that's going to be the topic I think you'll see pretty uniformly addressed throughout our presentation today. So, Ed, would you like to um, get us started kind of now into the substance uh, of our presentation? Uh, thank you. Uh, delighted. And first, let me thank my colleagues for uh, giving a special opportunity to uh, be a, a guest here on this panel. Uh, the Upchurch Wagner Firm is a wonderful mediation group, and uh, my colleagues here do a great job. And, I'm really honored to be asked uh, on behalf of the Church Watson and the University of Florida uh, Department. So, uh, what we'd like to do first is uh, talk about the, the the cost and time of the next slide. So, it's a pretty uh, standard idea that uh, that arbitration is not cheap. And, but one thing we wanted to focus on is that uh, we're now talking about international arbitration. There's, there's always been a sense that for domestic arbitration it's been sold as a faster, uh, cheaper alternative to trial. And certainly uh, that, that can be true. I think it's a little outside the scope of this presentation to talk about whether or not that actually is a reality. Uh, the easier position is when you talk about international arbitration, it never really was intended to be sold as such and cannot really be considered a faster, cheaper alternative to litigation. Uh, what's very common in international circles is that international arbitration is not, not ADR. Uh, it's not an alternative to court. It is often considered in international circles as the only only method of a dispute resolution uh, when foreign countries, uh, companies in foreign countries do business together, frequently in Europe, for example, 
uh, it, it's very seldom that commercial disputes will end up in court. Uh, if there's a contract, there's always selection of the International Arbitration Forum, either the ICC based in Paris, uh, or recently the ICDR, uh, which is the, the international arm for the American Arbitration Association, uh, offices in New York, Miami, and throughout the United States, uh, other organizations, London, London in Court of International Arbitration. Uh, a number of organizations have facilitated international arbitrations, and they tend to be sort of the go-to uh, place for resolving disputes. And, and the reason for that is uh, threefold. You can, if you get an arbitration award, you can confirm it pursuant to conventions, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, you, uh, two, uh, you get to neutral site. So there's not a, no one's really wanting, if you're doing business in Brazil and your client is from uh, New York, uh, Brazilians do not want to be in New York court. The, the New York court uh, client does not want to be in Brazil, Brazilian court. And so they'll decide to go, for example, in Miami, uh, agree to a neutral site. And, and it is neutral to the extent that the arbitrators will likely be from foreign countries. Uh, it may or may not be trained in the law that would govern. Uh, but the idea is that this is a neutral site, you know, similar to the, the big game that's coming up this weekend. We're going to go to a neutral site and be able to play it, and no one's going to have home court advantage. And the third reason you want to go to international arbitration is that it stops rogue lit litigation. So if, for example, I find myself in, in court, that spike that I had agreed to go to arbitration, I can go to court and stop it. So if you have that mindset, you understand that this is not an idea that you're going to try to uh, be a cheaper alternative, and so what, what that really means is that because of the culture of arbitration, you tend not to have shorter resolutions. There are no summary judgments. Uh, you're not getting discovery rulings. You're not getting motions eliminating on Daubert uh, type arguments, and so the whole thing is directed to a resolution and a final hearing. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about uh, earlier about the backloaded process. It, it does tend to be backloaded. Uh, to the extent that uh, there's substantial briefings that have to be drafted, uh, called memorials, they tend to be uh, at the end of the proceedings and simply right on top of each other, and then all of a sudden you're preparing yourself for a hearing. And so what ends up happening is that the whole process is is geared toward a final resolution, and unlike uh, court cases, does not have a natural exit where uh, where the the parties can get out of uh, the, the arbitration process, either in a you know, ordered mediation or in a, a resolution on summary judgment or motion to dismiss. And the last thing I want to talk about in terms of the cost, remember, if you, you're not, uh, you don't see this as ADR, uh, you recognize that this is a more expensive process. If I go to court, I don't have to pay for the judge. If I go to arbitration, I'm paying for the arbitrator, and often I'm paying for three of them, and they're charging per hour, and they charge uh, very high rates, uh, and they're, they're, they will earn them, uh, but they're, they're, it's a very expensive process. Uh, when I go to court, I don't pay for the clerk, uh, but I do pay for the mar arbitration administrator, and again, uh, they do a great job, and they, but they charge uh, a lot for it, and so uh, you're, you are seeing that the, uh, that the cost of arbitration can be expensive, and the last thing I would add to this is the last thing was sometimes comes up, so well, arbitration would be cheaper because I have to deal with all this ESI discovery and, and those kinds of things. That is not true anymore either uh, as uh, years have gone by, the more and more it's becoming that the discovery that you see in courts is getting into international arbitration, and certainly domestic arbitration. So uh, for all these reasons, uh, you cannot look at arbitration as a cheaper alternative, and so your clients thinking that, well, I don't really need to mediate because the cost of this thing is not going to be that significant. It's really the opposite. In fact, you know, likely it's going to be more expensive or can be more expensive than going to court. Uh, now, there, there, there are exceptions to that. You don't have appeals uh, and those kinds of things, but certainly uh, it's hard to argue that it, it would be any less expensive than going to court. So next slide. Um, the second sort of myth, if you will, about arbitration, and certainly not in the context of international international arbitration, is a lot of people would say, well, mediation seems like a waste of time because isn't arbitration sort of a, a glorified mediation instead of having a mediator, have an arbitrator up there, he's going to facilitate a resolution that's just and fair, and therefore I don't really need to have this separate mediation. I, I don't 
I also think that this is a myth because in the end of the day, the arbitrators are not there to resolve your dispute in, with, with, with justice. They're there to apply the law. And this is even more prevalent in international arbitration where the, where the arbitrators are often trained under the school code system. They're not there to do justice uh, and are likely to make a resolution any, not any different than a judge would uh, applying the law. And so uh, you do not have the opportunity in arbitration to really get a creative resolution any more than you do in court. And what we all have told our clients the one reason you might want to go to arbitration is that at the end of the day, there's going to be an award, there's going to be a loser or a winner, and likely that both parties aren't going to be particularly happy with the resolution. Uh, but there's going to be an award, and that's going to be it. And if you wanted to continue to do business, if there's a way to come to a creative solution, it's not going to be coming from an award. Uh, when I say as an arbitrator, I'm not there to try to resolve the dispute to try to figure out what a, what a way that the parties can continue to do business together. Somebody's arguing breach of contract. Uh, both sides are claiming both sides are breached, et cetera. And there's going to be a resolution of that. Uh, and so that may be what you want, uh, but, but recognize that you do not, you're not going to get the kind of flexibility that you would if you were in a mediation. And it's not any different uh, than were, if it were in court. That's like. Uh, the next thing I would point out is that, uh, again, losing an arbitration can be a just as offensive as and worse than losing a trial. And, and the reason I say this is that in arbitration, awards are final. Uh, there, you don't have an appeal. Uh, there's some effort sometimes to put in a appellate process, and there's some resolutions uh, that you can seek some kind of review of the form of the award, but the reality is you have to convince yourself that this is a final award. Um, and if you look at, for example, the New York Convention, the grounds are very limited to vacate an international award. Um, you have to find that the agreement uh, was invalid or that the party was in some kind of incapacity when he signed it, that the party had no notice, there was no due process, uh, that the, uh, ar the arbitrator, arbitrate panel had resolved some issue that was not in their uh, authority or the, that the, the panel was con uh, con uh, configured correctly. Uh, that the award is not binding yet, it's still not final, that the award uh, is somehow illegal, or that the whole thing violates public policy. Um, and so when you go through the list, you're not hearing, oh, you applied the law, law wrong, or you misinterpreted this contract. Those kind of arguments uh, fail. Uh, there have been efforts in domestic arbitration to apply that, what they call manifest disregard of the law, that is not applicable, for example, in, you know, in the 11th Circuit for Georgia, Alabama, Florida, and in fact, no matter where the award was entered, even in Florida, if it's deemed an international award, you cannot use you know, manifest disregard to vacate it. And the Love Circuit has gone beyond that and said that the manifest disregard does not apply even to domestic awards. So you've got a final award. So uh, you completely lose the leverage. I know, for example, there's appellate mediators, and you can be a certified appellate mediator. Well, you're not going to have that in, in, in an award. And at the end of the day, if there's a final award, it goes to district court to get confirmed. And then if they vacate it, you're starting the process all over again because it's not similar to an appellate situation where the appellate remands back to the trial court to go on consistent with their, award, their, their judgment. And in the arbitration, it goes back and they'll have to redo another uh, panel. <coughs> Ricardo? Yeah. Um, Richard, okay. Thank you. So uh, the right thing to mediate. Um, I think for the reasons that I just mentioned, uh, the cost of arbitration, uh, um, and you're going to have uh, very expensive uh, arbitrators, uh, a lot of them sometimes often from other countries, um, um, and uh, the administrative uh, institution and, and all the other costs associated with arbitration. I, I think that uh, just about any commercial, international commercial dispute uh, will be the right thing uh, to mediate. Um, I don't think that um, anything should be should not be considered for mediation as insofar as uh, whether it should be excluded. Uh, Richard, the next one. Um, then the next question um, becomes um, uh, uh, 17. Yeah, uh, should you mediate the entire matter or only portions of the matter? Well, again, for uh, my point of view uh, on this is for the same reasons that Richard, uh, that um, Ed just mentioned. Uh, you go to arbitration. Not only is it very expensive, uh, or at least let me put it this way: expensive. 
uh, but also uh, once you get um, uh, an, uh, an award and it's confirmed, it, it's going to pretty much be final. Uh, so you either win or lose, but that's it. Uh, you have no other control over that. So the goal will always be if you're going to go to mediation uh, during an arbitration process, uh, you, need, you, you should try to mediate the entire matter. Uh, you have the cost considerations that you can reduce significantly if you if you resolve the matter mediation. You also, uh, by going to mediation, will take control uh, if there is a settlement over the terms and conditions of the mediated mediated settlement agreement. That's not the case in arbitration, as Rich as Ed just mentioned. The arbitrator will enter an award, and uh, the arbitrator will rule according to the law, and and that and that will be it. Uh, in mediation, obviously, the parties can, if they settle, they can determine the the terms, conditions, uh, uh, payouts, uh, uh, and and other and, and other aspects of the of the settlement agreement, um, uh, which cannot be done during arbit uh, during arbitration. Also, during mediation, you can protect. Uh, business relationships, not always, but uh, oftentimes you can protect and and sometimes continue business relationships. Uh, that's also not necessarily the case in arbitration because arbitrators look back to a dispute, and their job is to uh, decide, uh, look at the facts of law, and decide and and enter an award. Now it is true. Next slide, please. Uh, it is true that um, sometimes uh, you know international. Um, um, Deals have become very, very comp complex, uh, very large, billions of dollars at time. Sometimes you have uh, single contracts uh, with bilateral relationships. Or so sometimes you have single contracts with multi-party relationships uh, or multi-contracts with multi-party relationships. So it may not be feasible in some cases to uh, mediate the entire thing, uh, and you may have to mediate uh, only some parts. But um, and, and that may be fine in some situations. That will, of course, add uh, cost because then you have to go back to, to arbitration or arbitrate the other, the other items. Um, um, but uh, if that's the only way to do it, then it's still I believe that mediation will be uh, effective because as to the things, as to the items or, or, or components that are mediated, if there are resolutions to those, you're still controlling the terms and conditions of those resolutions. You are still maybe protecting some of the relationship. And you and you lower in the cost. Um, so, uh, but still, the the, the, uh, the next slide, uh, Richard. Um, uh, yeah, I just covered that. Uh, it's still, the, the the main thing would be to try to um, to um, to uh, mediate the the entire matter. Obviously, sometimes you may have um, you know complex uh, issues of law, such as uh, choice of law, application of mandatory law, cross border. Regulatory issues or jurisdictional matters, uh, uh, other things such as extraterritorial application of evidential privilege, that may or may not be uh, subject. You know, something that you may want to mediate. But uh, in general, you want to try to mediate the whole thing. The other thing about the right thing to mediate is uh, uh, is is the timing, because as as Ed mentioned. Um, First of all, you should do it always in the context of an arbitration, and I'll talk about that later on a little bit more. And that's primarily for enforceability purposes on the New York con Convention. Uh, but secondly, uh, sometimes, especially in the complex uh, uh, deals with the complex disputes, if you mediate too early in the arbitration process, which in a way would be ideal because you save the on the cost, but if you do it too early, uh, you may, there may not be enough information, uh, enough uh, Evidence, if you will, uh, uh, to uh, for the parties, uh, and not only as to the the liability issues, but also the the damage and costs uh, that are being claimed, uh, to be able to to uh, have an effective mediation. So timing also, I think, plays a role in um, the right thing to mediate and how much of the dispute to mediate. Mediate, and of course, I'll talk about it later, but also timing because you should always mediate within the context of uh, an arbitration for. Uh, Best enforceability of the of the mediation agreement. Um, Ed. So we, we try to look at this project as not saying, well, look, this is impossible. We just give this up. But we do see these as challenges uh, that we want to overcome. But to recognize how to get there, we we do need to look at what are the obstacles to mediating a international arbitration dispute. So um, let's talk about the first one. 
uh, if you want to go to uh, that slide. So basically, we do not have a culture in these other countries that you're typically dealing with where there's an automatic uh, right or requirement to uh, our, uh, mediate. When we were, I had a panel with a arbitration uh, institution just a few weeks ago, and it was actually a, uh, the audience was to neutrals. It was an audience of arbitrators, and we were going over the new uh, AAA rules. And one of the rules that the AAA has is a requirement to mediate. Uh, and I say requirement, it, the rule uh, has a couple of caveats. It's not really mandatory because if any party decides they don't want to go to mediation, then it's not required. Secondly, it's really done before the uh, arbitrator is even uh, appointed or arbitrators if it's a panel. Uh, it's really done at the front end and with the interview of the administrator that's handling your case, they ask you, well, if you're interested in mediation, and for many reasons that Ricardo's pointed out, that well, it's too early in the case, well, no, we're not really going to mediation right now, and then you put the boxes and check no, and then you go straight to arbitration. So uh, perhaps that will be more productive later, uh, and they'll try to alter that, but I will, will tell you that there's a separate rule for the AAA where you do your preliminary hearing, and one of the things you're supposed to raise as an arbitrator is whether or not there's other alternative disputes, that resolutions that you can go through. Obviously, one of the obvious ones is mediation. And I did ask the panel, or the, the panel of the audience of the panel uh, arbitrators, did any of them believe that they had the power to force parties to go to mediation as an arbitrator? And two to one, all of them said no. Uh, none of them felt like they could require somebody to go uh, that uh, that all had to be agreed to by the parties. They could suggest it, but unlike a judge, where a judge can require you, it's in the rules of both of the both the state and uh, federal courts, for example, in Florida, they can require you to go to mediation. Here, uh, they they cannot uh, do that, and so uh, it's it, it's an interesting issue because at that point, then somebody's got to suggest it, and there's always concern as an advocate. Well, am I going to look weak if I call the other side and say, look, maybe we should be mediating this thing? Uh, so it is a, it's a, it is a touchy issue. I do encourage, if any, an arb anyone's an arbitrator on, the, on this call, that they do suggest it. Uh, the way I handle it as an arbitrator is say that, look, I'm not here to mediate your case. Uh, I would encourage you, as I would encourage anybody in the, in the dispute, to, to consider it. I'm going to let you guys handle that, um, unless you guys want to you know, put in a deadline for you guys to do it, if you want to talk about that. But otherwise, uh, I'm going to go forward. Uh, and that's really my job to do that as an arbitrator. That's really how the arbitrators look at it. Um, so, you know, you, you, you have a, you have this idea that you're not really required to go to mediation. They're not really common in these, in these countries. And there is a reluctance even amongst uh, the international tra practitioners. I was on another panel where uh, the, we're, we're talking about international public issues, and one of the panelists were all very well recognized international arbitrators who said, look, you guys have a duty to make law in international public issues. There's not a lot of law being made, so we have investor state type disputes. We need law being made, uh, which I thought was very interesting. And, and I, I kind of gave a practical response and say, and, and Ricardo and I had a drink last night and said this is the same thing in his experience, is that no clients ever told him or me that they want to make law. Uh, what the clients have told me is they want to solve their problem. And often, the resolution of the problem is not a final award, it's not a jury trial, it's not an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. It may happen, maybe that may be the answer, but it's, at least in trial courts, uh, it's, it's not the answer in 99.95% of the cases. As you know, the settlement rates in state court and federal courts are very high. There, there are less in arbitration, but uh, it's, it's technically the arbitrations, I think, settle around 60-70% of the time is a lot lower uh, than in the, the court cases. But I think the bottom line is that uh, most clients, I would think, you know, that's not 100% true. But I think most clients of business disputes uh, do not see that making law is the you know, primary goal of getting them out of the, of the problem they're in. Uh, the next slide, um, and Ricardo touched on this earlier, and, and I want to go back to it a little bit. And, and the question is, you know, when can you uh, uh, mediate, and uh, this is again a practical problem dealing with arbitration. And, and I, I specifically point to international arbitration, and, and it's really the following: 
basically the way these international arbitrations work, and you know, many, many, many people on the call have had a lot of experience in them, but to those who have not, it is that they're essentially uh, written directs with uh, very large memorials, and the claimant will usually do the first memorial, the respondent will respond, and the claimant will do a reply, and there is often a rejoinder. There may even be more briefings if there's been counterclaims, etc. Uh, this takes a multi-month period of time. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, interviews of your clients and their witnesses, and so there are written directs. And then the hearing itself will be scheduled for a week or two weeks, and, and basically it will be openings and then cross-examinations of the written directs, uh, and then uh, questions by the arbitrators, and then an award will follow, you know, often months later. Uh, a lot of, usually on these schedules, the, the work is fairly backloaded, and you find yourself working on these memorials, and then shortly thereafter uh, having the trial, and often not getting the other side's case uh, until really uh, right before the hearing. It's like, oh, okay, now I know what they're talking about. Oh, I see what they're saying about that clause. Uh, and so these are things you're learning, you know, as you go. Uh, and then you basically are trying to get ready for trial and preparing your witnesses for, you know, fairly rigorous cross-examination on the witness statements they made. And so you don't have a lot of time to sit back and say, well, let's go to the city and sit down and uh, spend a day mediating. Uh, so it is a practical problem. Uh, I, I do think anybody would be wise to try to avoid putting yourself in this crunch. Often I'm shocked when I see other parties get involved in these arbitrations and they basically put themselves in a schedule that really prevents them from working on any other matter. Um, but uh, you, you do have to realize that uh, the thing's going to go forward. And, and the other cultural thing is this, that the arbitrators themselves, uh, there's a practical problem. They, they are there to try the case and they expect to be tried. And they've, you know, in, in all fairness to them, are not likely to move the hearing for, you know, I need to stop this thing because I won't have a mediation. They've scheduled a week or two weeks, uh, if not more, for this hearing. Uh, unlike a judge, they don't have a case right behind them ready to go if you settle. And so, obviously, if you settle, that's great. Uh, but they say, look, we settled this week, and if you resolve it, that's great. And, and, and frankly, they may even charge you if you settle it too close to the hearing. Uh, so, look, I reserved that week, and, you know, a lot of these guys are professional uh, neutrals and do not have uh, work to work on that schedule that week, and they would have taken us some other arbitration. And now that you've taken that out, so you need to think all in your head. Um, and I've seen it. it. You know, you don't see these cases settle on the courthouse steps. They, they go. So really for you, your client, uh, and the arbitrators, for the lawyer, the client, and the arbitrators, you really need to be thinking mediation early uh, when you're mapping out uh, the uh, procedural course. Yeah, I, I think so. I think I also think that you might, when you're scheduling, try to figure out, say, okay, if I get my memorial in, you get the response memorial in, you know, can we then look at maybe a mediation if we've scheduled this out correctly? Uh, but I, I do think the mindset you have to have is that once the memorial process starts, it's a freight train and it's not likely to be derailed. I'll throw to Mr. Cato. Uh, can you go back? Yeah. So, um, again, we're talking about uh, cultural issues, uh, language issues. Um, Ed touched upon of those, uh, some of the things. Uh, from a cultural point of view, um, cross-border mediation, um, uh, you know, you're dealing with um, oftentimes attorneys and parties from other countries, uh, oftentimes from civil law countries. Um, oftentimes uh, they may have a, a, a different approach uh, to, uh, to mediation, to conciliation. Uh, they may uh, uh, co want to cooperate uh, with the, uh, you know, uh, mediation and uh, negotiation process, so they may think that that would show weakness if they do that and show weakness in front of the clients. Um, so you need to deal with all the, uh, understand the culture of the of the other side of the of the media, uh, of the dispute. Um, are they uh, high contact culture where information is found, for example, in the context and not always verbal and they value the tradition, or are they low con uh, context culture where they communicate directly in a straightforward manner? The, the things need to be uh, appreciated uh, and understand, understood before the mediation. Um, 
uh, lang uh, I'll get to language, but one of the ways to resolve this, uh, and that also ties into language, is, uh, and I think it was one of the questions, uh, should there be a, uh, a mediation who speaks the language and knows the culture? Uh, yes, uh, I think that if the dispute is uh, sufficiently large uh, to warrant the additional expense, um, it would be a good idea, and it's often used to have a co-mediator from the region of, of of the other side of the dispute, uh, he or she will understand the culture, the law, and can work together with, uh, let's say, the, uh, for example, the American mediator uh, that may also be mediated in the case. Uh, that's not always you don't always use a co-mediator, but in situations where you have a lot of cultural issues uh, and language issues, may be uh, it may be good to do a good thing to do. Then uh, language consideration very very important also. Um, Obviously, the mediator should understand the language. Uh, if, if there's a problem with the language, you need to make sure that you consider that ahead of the time and uh, uh, make provisions for qualified in, interpreters, uh, for verbal communication, and translators uh, for uh, for written uh, for documents, etc. Also. Um, if the language is not determined, a lot of the things can be addressed in, uh, in a mediation clause, uh, uh, mediation agreement, and, and an ADR clause. But if uh, if the language is not addressed, which you know, what's the language of the mediation? Sometimes uh, the the rules of mediation, uh, international rules of mediation that are chosen. Uh, uh, will we'll address that, and that also should be chosen uh, in the ADR mediation uh, clause. For example, Rule 18 of the ICDR mediation rules provide that if the parties have not agreed otherwise, the language, language or languages of the mediation shall be that of the documents containing the mediation agreement, and Article 5.5 of, of the London Court of International Arbitration mediation rules indicates that uh, the language in which the mediation will be conducted, the mediator will decide the language in which the mediation will be conducted. So these things will be also good to be to address up front so that you have a, more of a seamless uh, mediation and not have to deal with these situations uh, after the fact. The other thing that's important in international uh, situations is selection of the mediation. Mediate, the mediator or mediators, they need to know uh, not only the substance, uh, substantive aspect of the dispute, but also have experience in that area and cross-border mediation, uh, have sophistication in that area, um, and um, uh, should be uh, able to communicate a, a, as well um, um, in the language. Uh, another thing about the language, if there's going to be more than la one language being used, if there's a mediator, a, a mediation settlement reach, and uh, the mediation settlement is going to be in, in more than one language, uh, I think it would be a good idea to designate an official version of the mediation settlement agreement, and uh, preferably in the language selected for the mediation so that any dispute can be resolved that way. Uh, selection of the mediation, a mediator is also important because um, not all, um, no, uh, and it should also be part of the ADR clause mediation agreement. Uh, the mediator, a lot, of, a lot of countries, they think the mediator uh, makes the decisions, uh, and that needs to be explained. Uh, uh, mediator, uh, in some countries, can be facilitative or ev evaluative. Uh, for example, Rule 7 of the ICDR mediation rules gives the mediator the option to make oral or written recommendations for settlement. Uh, rule 6 of the CPR European mediation procedures permits the mediator to present a final settlement proposal to the party. So in other words, you need to know the things up front, preferably the, uh, the designate those in the mediation clause of the agreement so that there are no surprises and um, uh, the mediation can proceed in a, in a more uh, uh, organized way. Uh, I'm sorry, Richard, I forgot the next slide. Um, mistrust is a, it's a big thing. Um, I remember two years ago I gave a, a presentation of the request of uh, Swiss Re in a fairly uh, advanced and sophisticated Latin American country, and it was given to their uh, in-house and out outside counsel. Um, and I was surprised, uh, and I was speaking about uh, U.S.-style mediation because I really wanted to push it in that country. And it was a civil, civil law country. I was surprised after the media, the, my presentation how many lawyers came over to me, and the amount of uh, hostility they had about mediation was pretty significant. And it was because they didn't understand it. They thought the mediation, the mediator was going to make uh, 
to take away the case from them. The mediator was going to make uh, the decision. Some of them thought it's going to it's going to take away a client. It's going to take away a fee. So these are all the cultural things that that need to be understood and and appreciated uh, when you're getting ready for for international uh, mediation. Um, and uh, uh, next slide. Um, yeah, uh, mistaken belief that the mediator will decide the case. That needs to be covered. Will the cost double? Uh, well, you know, you need to consider what Ed said in the beginning, how uh, expensive an international arbitration can be, uh, uh, depending you have one arbitrator, three arbitrator, where where they're from and so forth. So uh, I think that uh, trying to uh, to go to mediation and try to resolve the whole dispute of mediation and try to take charge of the of the shape of your settlement agreement, uh, I think more than would justify the cost. And remember always that uh, once the uh, international arbitration award is confirmed, it's pretty much final and uh, and there are very very limited uh, rights to appeal. Um, okay, uh, Ed. Sure, and, and just to you know, follow up on uh, th this last slide here, it, it is an education process to try to get people familiar with the mediation process to understand both on the client side uh, and the opposing counsel side to understand why this is good. And why do I need to do there? Can't you just sell this in a room? And while well, you get confidentiality if you go to mediation, you can say things to the mediator you can't sell to the other side. And the mediator coming things coming from a mediator uh, have a lot more force. Than things coming from opposing counsel, and for all the wonderful reasons why mediation works on the trial court and the federal and state level, uh, it certainly is just as uh, valid for uh, using it in the international arbitration. It's just uh, they have not been ingrained in it as we are here since we've been doing mandatory mediation uh, at least as long as I've been practicing, if not longer. So if we go to the next slide, um, or I'll well, oh, sorry, the prior slide. So, well, one one thing you hear a lot too is, well, this thing is just too complex to be mediated. And the ideas of mediations are great for, you know, where it's just you know, somebody suing for money, uh, and and therefore, uh, you know, it's just somebody's going to have to pay. It doesn't matter how we're going to come up with payment terms and that kind of thing. Uh, I always think this is a silly uh, uh, myth because if a case can be arbitrated, it can be mediated. Uh, certainly, if you're in a dispute that's complex arbitration, then certainly then there, there are uh, so that you can mediate it. There, it. It's even easier to mediate something than to arbitrate because as an arbitrator, you have to figure out what the right answer is. Mediation, you can come up with creative solutions. So I, I, I really don't think there's any case that's too complex to be mediated. I also will, so I was on a panel again and they said, well, who, who's going to mediate these cases? There's nobody available. There's no professional international mediators. And luckily, uh, Firms like Upchurch Watson are, are changing that. They're, they're specializing in it. When I was chair of the Ford Bar National Law Session, we uh, set up a, a committee for international mediation. We've been trying to focus on that at the session. And, and third, there certainly are plenty of people that can be an international mediator. They're simply international arbitrators now. If they're not your arbitrator in the case, they're perfectly free to handle it as mediator. And so uh, I think it's a, a, another myth, this idea that we can't find somebody capable of resolving mediation in this complex case. So the next slide. Um, you know, again, this is a you know, cultural issue. Um, can we have a fair process? And, uh, you know, again, uh, you, you, this is just an education system. Is that, look, if you think that the mediation process will not be fair, what do you think is going to happen in arbitration? Uh, certainly, you have so much more control over the proceedings in mediation than you do arbitration. So, again, I think this is just a cultural issue. This idea, is, as Ricardo was saying, that how they're going to take away the case is have to be broken down and have to explain to them that you're going to have a lot of control and you do not have to settle. And if you don't like the last offer from the other side, you can get up and walk out and go away. But if you don't like the award from the arbitrator, that's not an option for you. You don't like the way the arbitration hearing is going. You're not going to be able to leave, and you're going to go in the next day and you know, go through the next day. So, uh, again, uh, this is, again, an educational process, and I think if you can do that, you will be in good shape. So, uh, next slide. I think, then, I think what you're hearing uh, for, and this is the, my final slide on this topic, on these obstacles, is that 
you, to, because mediation is consent-based, there is simply no obstacle you cannot overcome. It's a matter of education and it's agreeing to the other side. I think you have to be creative. Uh, and, and I think one thing you could consider uh, is is approaching in your your your, your pre-hearing uh, schedule with the arbitrator panel when they schedule out the, the case is tell the other side, look, we might want to consider me aiding this. I have no idea if we want to do that. But let's put a deadline in here uh, and let's have that done. And so when it's later in the case and, and things are not going particularly well and you want to raise mediation, it doesn't look like you're, you're the one to try to do it. Uh, this is typically what's done in court. We have a every court case requires, especially in federal court, you pick a mediation deadline fairly early on uh, that you have to mediate sometime you know, before summary judgment or after summary judgment, uh, and you have to do it, and you have to pick the mediator, and, and the judge expects you to, to do that. If I think if you had that mindset at the beginning of your national arbitration cases, you might be able to uh, look like this is going to happen, and you don't have to worry about the optics of either one suggesting it. Carl? Okay, next slide. Yeah, enforcement. Um, before, during, uh, and about contracts. Richard, the next slide, please. Um, Pre-arbitration mediated settlement uh, versus settlement during pending arbitration. Well, I alluded to this before. Um, if you, uh, there are several ways uh, of enforcing a, a mediated settlement agreement internationally, and this is one of the areas that I think uh, needs to be considered carefully. The first one, of course, which is the least uh, favorable one, is as a breach of contract, the, uh, uh, as a breach of contract in the local courts of the foreign country, that would be expensive, time-consuming, and probably not very reliable or effective. The second one would be under the New York Convention of 1958, which has been uh, 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 approved by 100, uh, 144 countries. And as Ed uh, alluded to before, once you get a, a confirmed uh, final award in international arbitration. Uh, it, you can enforce it with very, very limited uh, recourse uh, against enforceability. So if you have a mediation uh, in, in an arbitration, what would be the best time? Well, we talked about the availability of document and proofs and so forth, but uh, if you want to get it, uh, if you want to get your mediated settlement agreement to be enforced uh, and enforceable under the um, New York Convention, you should, have, you should do the mediation during and within the context of, uh, of an arbitration. If you settle a matter of mediation before uh, an arbitration, the, the arbitrators are selected, an arbitration is in panel, or if there was no uh, agreement to arbitrate, there is a real question whether that, uh, uh, that well, if, if it's, if it's some, uh, reduced to an award, there's a real question as to whether that award would be enforceable on the, the New York Convention. It's still being debated, but it's a real question as to that. Uh, but if it is, uh, if if the settlement takes place and mediation during the context of an arbitration, whether it be an early arbitration or in the middle of the arbitration, then um, the um, uh, that would be a, a consent award that would be, that would uh, be uh, turned into a uh, I'm sorry, a consent settlement that would be turned into an award, consent award, and. Uh, there is no question that that can be enforced uh, under the provisions of the New York Convention. So the the other uh, the other way that uh, uh, they've been trying to get around this this issue is um, through uh, what they call ARB Med ARB and uh, and Med ARB. And these are processes where in both of those processes they the process starts out as an arbitration, and then at some point in time uh, the parties uh, Sort of step step aside, if you will, and go to a mediation to try to um, to resolve the matter. A mediation, and then the the arbitrator would uh, uh, turn the mediation settlement agreement into an award. In fact, the English uh, uh, provider, Center for Effective Dispute Resolution, has uh, a mediation window for this specific purpose uh, in their rules uh, to allow for enforcement of the mediation. Uh, of the uh, mediation settlement uh, agreement as an award. Uh, the thing about this again is, uh, if you're going to use ARB, MetaARB, or MetaARB, uh, sometimes they use uh, the same person as a mediator or arbitrator. I think that uh, that can have that can be risky because uh, you will have to have a very express, written, uh, detailed uh, consent signed by the parties and the lawyers, uh, so that so as to avoid um, and they're, they're, you know you have to be really detailed about. They're, they know what they're doing. They know what they're waving. That they're going to waive conflicts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
And uh, still, some jurisdictions may not uh, recognize such a waiver. So the best thing, uh, even though it would be more expensive, is to, uh, to have um, a, two persons, one an arbitrator and another one a uh, mediator. And the, um, uh, the, they will both uh, participate in non-confidential sessions, but only the mediator will participate in confidential sessions so as to avoid any conflict issues. And then one, uh, if there's a settlement, it would then be turned into a, um, an, an award and enforced under the New York Convention. Next slide, please. Okay, and I'll just uh, share, Ed and Ricardo, we've been covering a lot of substance. We have about eight, no, maybe just about eight minutes left to uh, cover the substance. Okay. Um, contracts often require mediation. That is true. Uh, uh, again, the uh, mediation uh, clause in the contract should be fairly detailed. Uh, it should not require mediation only uh, and, and, and preclude um, arbitration or litigation, but it should be a uh, mediation or condition proceeded into arbitration or, or litigation. Uh, it should be uh, set forth definitely how the, the process of mediation is going to be convened and when it's going to start and when it's going to be terminated and it should not be left to the option of one party. Are they f favored because of gaming? I think, Ed, you wanted to talk a little bit about that? I, I think the, the challenge here is that when you have a contractual requirement to mediate or you go to arbitration, uh, and sometimes it's in the context of uh, mediation, often they'll say that the presence of the company must be together. And Ed, can you speak up just a little bit? You might have moved from your mic. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Thank you. So sometimes the contracts require uh, that you say that you have to go to mediation or you have to have some kind of meeting. The challenge here is that often what will happen is that somebody will say, well, we had that mediation. They came in there and they weren't acting in good faith and therefore uh, there's no jurisdiction for this arbitration because now uh, we, we haven't met the condition preceded and you, you really just cause yourself problems. And I've seen you even find yourself even in court fighting, so now you're in three places, you have the mediation, you're in arbitration, now you're in court fighting, well, you can go to arbitration. Um, I think if you're a, a corporate lawyer on the panel, you should, uh, are in the audience right now or listening to this later, you should really consider you know, those kinds of clauses uh, and really rely on the advocates after the dispute has risen uh, to fashion when and how to go to mediation because you make it a contractual requirement, you could be inviting yourself problems. Okay, um, next slide please. Richard, yeah, uh, 32, 32 please. Uh, yeah, how can we get to mediation? Uh, we already discussed about the mediation agreement and the ADR clause. Uh, again, uh, in order to, they usually enforce, uh, not always, uh, there's some risk to that, but the more detail that the mediation agreement uh, is in providing the rules, how to select the arbitrator, the language, the location, the law, and so forth, the more chances there will be to, uh, to, to have it enforced. Uh, and that's one way to get to mediation. The other way is uh, by agreeing on parties. Uh, even during a mediation, if, even if there was no mediation, even during an arbitration, even if, if there was no mediation agreement, uh, the parties can always uh, go to mediation, just like they can do it in court here in Florida. They decide to go to, me to mediation and, 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 and do it that way. Uh, so that, that would be the, the two main uh, ways to, um, to go to um, to, uh, to mediation in an international dispute. Um, I want to say something briefly I forgot to say before about the cultural and, and lo uh, international dispute. The other thing that you need to look and consider and research carefully is confidentiality. We used to hear in Florida mediations being confidential. Uh, the degree of confidentiality can vary from country to country, from legislation to legislation, so you need to look at that as well. And, and I, I'm sorry I overlooked that. Okay, next slide. Um, you can solve uh, that by doing the, our, the mediation in Florida, of course. But yeah, you can. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, would a tribunal ever order it? Um, I don't think so, Ed. You can. Um, I, I know that you mentioned that some of the rules provide as an option, but I don't think a tribunal will ever order it, uh, Ed. Yeah, I, as I said, there's no requirement in the international rules, for example, the, the ICDR uh, now, where they adopted it, it even domestic rules, but under the domestic rules, uh, it's not mandatory. You can opt out of it, and uh, they're, they're not going to order it. Uh, they, they, don't, they, they have authority, and I think they're really concerned if they do. I think it's silly. I think it, our, if it were up to me, I think you could order it. But 
but it's simply not the cultural. And so you are, anyone on this call that's in this situation, you, if you're an advocate, you're going to have to take the first move. Uh, Richard, I think you, you go next. So, as you can see, we've talked a lot. We've mentioned the word education probably 20 or 30 times. Um, it is important for us all to understand. Uh, clients, if you're on the call, uh, advocates, lawyers, counselors, if you're on the call, um, and even uh, neutrals who serve as uh, mediators in cross-border uh, commercial arbitration disputes. We need to you know, understand that it is sometimes a process of educating. Uh, so you can be thinking about planning, so you can be thinking about the right time, the optimal time, in the appropriate case uh, for the appropriate client. Um, and the consent-based processes, I think Ed hit it uh, on the head when he said uh, any obstacle, any challenge can really be, be overcome. Uh, and, and it does require the education and the uh, work. Certainly uh, clients and counsel who are considering it can also look to uh, their prospective mediators or neutrals to help them potentially uh, explore uh, you know, the uh, right way and the right time uh, to get to mediation. Um, these are just a few of the points on this last slide. Uh, you know, we've talked about education, we've talked about um, you know the advantages today of mediation and uh, the benefits of utilizing it earlier because of the end-loaded nature of the international arbitration process. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Ed or, or Ricardo, would you like to uh, uh, share any other insights? We have a few minutes left before I need to go to the all-important CLE uh, number slide. Um, no, I cannot think of anything right now, Ed. Uh, the only thing I would say is, you know, I, I think the Upchurch Watson firm for inviting me, and uh, I do think that you should consider you know, firms like theirs or other professional mediators to resolve a dispute. The, the one thing I did strike me uh, with, with this idea that we'll use the arbitrator to mediate your dispute, I, I'm, I'm totally against that. Uh, I, I don't think you can have effective mediation if you're going to have the fact finder in the mediation. You're not going to be able to be candid like you would be the mediator. And, um, and I, I've always felt it's problematic when you're required in court, for example, to go to a uh, magistrate. Uh, it's fine if it's a magistrate not on your case, but if it's the magistrate on your case, again, that person may end up being a fact finder on some discovery speed or something, and you're, you're not going to be able to be candid, and you're not going to be able to get whatever you said out of their head, uh, that you may tell them on something, and it turns out that's something that they have in your head, even though that doesn't come into evidence. So uh, other than that, uh, you can see how we enjoy talking about these things, and certainly we're all available. <laughs> if we didn't uh, answer your question, so we, we try to cover them, I thought we did. Um, and, but if we did, um, you know, you have our, our you know, we have uh, the Upshur Watson's content information, or they can get hold of me as well. And I appreciate the time. Well, Ed, thank, thank you. you very much. Yes, and Ricardo, thank you as well. And I do think uh, Ed's point is well taken. It's it's hard to unring the bell, and best practices I think would cause, uh, you know, the need for people to have uh, different neutrals serving as mediators as and and the different neutrals serving as arbitrators uh, in their case. Um, that's applicable, I think, to not only the cross-border commercial arbitration mediation that we're talking about, but also any other uh, type of arbitration where mediation is an option, uh, where it may be utilized. Uh, uh, that's kind of my view of best practices. Uh, thank you all again for joining us uh, today for our webinar entitled The Mediation Option in International Commercial Arbitration. For those of you who are listen only and can't see the slides, um, the Florida Bar course number uh, is 1409085N, as in Nancy. Again, 1409085N. Uh, we've been approved for uh, one hour of general CLE credits. Uh, we also have certification credits for international law of one hour as well. Um, we'd like to also uh, show you there our email addresses. Please email Ricardo or myself, um, and we can certainly get together with Ed and respond to any questions and follow-up that you may have. Uh, again, uh, uh, Ed is on a, a panel uh, that Ricardo is on. He's a moderator at the ILAT conference on February 27 down in Miami. And also I'd like to share that we do have um, an upcoming webinar 
uh, scheduled for February 19th at noon entitled Guess Who's Coming to Mediation and we will have on that uh, webinar uh, my colleague and shareholder here Michelle Jernigan as well as uh, Lawrence Cullen and Don Brandy, uh, both uh, panel mediators here with Upchurch, Watson, White and Max. Thank you all for joining us today and we, looking, we look forward to uh, future webinars.